Shalom, brothers and sisters. Last Thursday's thought was about polygamy in the Latter-day Saint movement. And as expected, it was very controversial. And I got a number of people messaging me or leaving comments wanting me to say things like that Joseph Smith wasn't a polygamist or that he was only sealed to all these women and they weren't real marriages or they didn't have carnal relationships with these women, these wives. Um, I'm not going to do that for a number of reasons. Number one, because I don't believe any of that. I, 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 I do think that these in Joseph Smith's mind were wives just like Emma was a wife. I, I have not seen any evidence to the contrary. In fact, I've seen evidence that shows that in, I can't say this for every single person because I don't know exactly which women he actually married and which ones he didn't. Um, but there's too much circumstantial evidence to show that he was definitely a polygamist in spite of the fact of lying and saying that he wasn't. And there's too much evidence, in my opinion, again, I'm not a historian, there's too much evidence that shows that he did have relationships based on Emma's jealousy, throwing women out of their house, letters that were found later that were supposed to have been burnt saying, Emma, if Emma comes by, we're in danger, but if she's not around, come on over, it'll be great. Um, so what I want to do for this Thursday's thought instead is I want to talk about what we can learn from Joseph Smith's polygamy. Because Joseph Smith isn't the center of the Latter-day Saint movement or the Fellowship of Christ. Joseph Smith is merely the founder. And let's be honest, anybody whose name was Joseph, whose father's name was Joseph, and who was from the tribe of Joseph, could have translated the Book of Mormon and been the, the person called as a prophet to do the things that he did. Joseph Smith just happened to be the man the Lord called to do this. It doesn't make him perfect. So he isn't, we, we can't expect him to be like a mini Jesus or anything like that. Only Jesus is perfect. So two things I want to mention quickly before I get into this. The first is that if we're waiting for perfection, then number one, we already have it through the atonement and grace of Jesus Christ. We are saved and we are exalted the moment that we accept Jesus Christ and we begin growing in that grace. That's why it's grace. We can make mistakes and keep moving forward. Secondly, if that's not how it works, if it really was works-based, then Jesus is going to be all alone in heaven because none of us are good enough and we never will be. So rather than expecting some sort of perfect prophet, we need to be okay with the fact that he's a man. And that takes me to the second point, which is if we look at the Old Testament, we have King David, great war hero, with a king that united Israel, all these great things about him. But what did he do? He not only committed adultery, but to hide his sin, which obviously didn't work because it's written in the scriptures, he had her husband killed so that he could marry her. That's, that's some pretty dark stuff right there. And yet he's still considered one of the greatest kings, if not the greatest king, of Israel. Then let's look at the Book of Mormon. We have Lehi. Without Lehi, we would not have the Book of Mormon. He sent Nephi back for the brass plates, and because of that, the Lehites and later the Mulekites were able to have the gospel. I don't know why a prophet couldn't rewrite the law and all that. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but it, it's definitely a lot easier to go back and get plates that are already written, right? So yes, Mormon compiled the book. Yes, Moroni finished it and buried the plates, but without Lehi, we would have nothing. And yet, what happened in the wilderness when Nephi broke his bow? Lehi lost his faith. He fell. His son Nephi had to help him come back to the Lord. So this idea that Joseph Smith is a prophet that made mistakes isn't new. We see it throughout the scriptures. So there's no reason why, if it happened in the past, it shouldn't happen in our day as well. I could talk about Moses and his failings and, and literally every prophet that's in the New Testament, Old Testament, Apostle in the New Testament. But I, I'm not going to. It's a waste of time. What I want to do instead is take the lessons that we can learn from Joseph Smith and talk about that today. So the first thing that I want to talk about is if you feel called to be a polygamist, that doesn't mean that you have to accept that calling. And it's very, very important to understand because the biggest mistake in my mind that Joseph Smith did 
was not talking to Emma about this and figuring out together as a couple how they were supposed to add to their marriage. And so because of that, he broke Emma's heart. He lied to her. He told her that they were just ceilings when they were more than that. He told her that he wasn't married to certain women, that he was. And I'm going to tell you, my wife and I, we've looked into polygamy. We've talked to people who are polygamists and polyamorous as part of our, our missionary work, part of our ministry. And from my own personal you know, opinion here, number one, I find it to be very lonely because yes, you, I, I have seven kids. I love all of them, but they're always competing and fighting for my time. I don't want to have to pick and choose who gets my time. But the one thing that every successful relationship has is open and honest communication. Every book that I read about polygamy or polyamory all said the same thing. There has to be trust. There has to be honesty. Communication has to be open. No lies. And I'm going to tell you point blank, I learned a lot reading these books. I have no desire and no interest in polygamy or polyamory, but I learned a lot about my monogamous relationship with my wife because the stuff in there was just really good practical advice for any relationship. And I want to extend that out. If you feel called to be a polygamist and you feel that God's telling you to go behind your spouse's back, that's not God. It's Satan. Run away. Go straight to your spouse. Tell them what's up. Every polygamist or polyamorous person that I have talked to, a group, I should say, people, whatever, that I've talked to, they all say the same thing. When it's a beautiful, working relationship, at first there's this temptation to hide what they're feeling. But once they're open and honest and come clean and talk about it, it's that open communication that allows the love to grow. But as we see with Joseph Smith, it's the lack of communication that stifles that growth. So let's get into the second thing we can learn from Joseph Smith. He married some women that were married. Now, I don't like saying it like that because the way I see it, men and women are equal. And so therefore, I think it's just as fair to say that these women who were married, took a second husband and married Joseph Smith. And I have seen evidence that Joseph Smith is not the only person who married women who were married to other men. So there are women out there who married multiple husbands in his church that were not Joseph Smith. It's just Joseph Smith's the one everybody talks about because he's the founder. So if you go to Wikipedia, and I'm gonna put a couple of links to things in um, the comments, not the comments, I'm sorry, the description. But if you look at Wikipedia, there's a list here of supposed women that, that Joseph Smith married in addition to Emma, and well, and including Emma. And the reason why I say supposed is because there's about maybe a little over 50 women here. And based on what I've read from this, I don't know that Joseph Smith married all of these women. I, I think it's kind of ridiculous, honestly, to have this many wives. I know Brigham Young had like 50 wives also, but, I mean, you can't even see one wife a month. That has got to be horrendously lonely. So I I just can't fathom that. That said, um, and, and just so you know, if a man marries multiple women, he's a polygamist. If a woman marries multiple husbands, then she's a polygamist. But if this woman is married to this man who's married to this woman who's married to this man that is called group marriage it's not technically a form of polygamy so i would say that joseph smith was more of a polyamorous even though that didn't technically exist back then um in his relationships and he was polygamist so back to this there's one two three four five six seven eight nine 10, 11, 12. So at least 12 women here, and this is all the way up to 1843, that 
had already had one husband and took Joseph Smith as a second husband. Whether they had more husbands than this, I don't know. Because it was all secret, there aren't any records, and I don't even know that he definitely married all of these women. But I do know that he married some of them, maybe most of them. Um, so this begs the question, can a woman who already has a husband be sealed and married to another husband? According to the church I grew up in, the Salt Lake City Church, the answer is no. They don't allow that. But in Joseph Smith's church, they very clearly did do this. Do I recommend it? No. But I'm going to go back to what I said before. If you feel the Lord calling you and your family and another family to do this, it all has to be based on open communication, love, understanding, and trust. Even one lie can destroy the whole thing. I've, I've heard so many stories from people who are polygamists or polyamorous. It's, you know, I, I, talk, I talk to people all the time uh, with various different lifestyles. And the ones that have gotten hurt, the reason why was because of one lie. A lot of times it was just one small lie that triggered an avalanche of everything collapsing. So if you feel called to this lifestyle, again, I do not recommend it as the revelation and doctrine of the saints says one man and one woman to the lord or if it's like of the like then one man and one man and one woman and one woman it's only if the desire is there you know all these things you have to go through a lot if you want to add to that relationship but if you don't have a good solid foundation in your marriage i highly recommend not adding to it so what's the lesson we can learn from this well, I think the biggest thing here is some of these women, the reason why we know that they definitely had carnal relations with Joseph Smith is because they thought that or suspected that their children, or at least one of their children, didn't belong to their first husband. Their, I, I don't know if first is the right word, but um, the original husband, uh, but maybe belonged to Joseph Smith. Now, that's not going to happen unless there was you know, the marriage was made, made official, so to speak. So we know that this was going on. It definitely isn't right for any, for everybody. But the lesson that we need to learn here is that there must be trust, honesty, love. And this is really key. If you're living in a situation where you, you're, you're married to, to one man and you take another husband and perhaps this other man has another wife and isn't living with you is that husband is this relationship strong enough that he's willing to raise a child that isn't his now in my mind the answer has to be yes because what christian isn't going to love and help raise any child but that's one of the questions the lord poses to us in the revelation when he says as long as these children are raised up unto me if there's going to be hatred i i, I know people who were born because of an affair and their parents just treated them like garbage that cannot happen we cannot allow that as saints so these are real serious questions you have to look at and ask yourself you can't just say oh joseph smith did it so it's okay let's let's, let's, let's all go do this because if we're doing it just to satisfy human lusts then it, it's not righteous. It has to be done out of love and through the Spirit of God. And if it's done through true love and through the Spirit of God, then everything will work out because that love will multiply and there will be more love. So the last thing I want to talk about here is underage marriages. Because, like it or not, Joseph Smith did marry women that were too young uh, girls no, i shouldn't say women girls little girls um uh, looking at the ages here maybe one because we're not sure exactly when the first one happened here with fanny agler but definitely going down one two three four five looks like five women who are under the age of 18 
Uh, one is 14, two are 17, one is 16, another 17 year old. So let's be real here. I, I don't care about the times. I, I don't care about any of this is wrong. Joseph Smith committed a sin here. This is his David and Bathsheba moment for, for sure. I mean, it's definitely one where he's not telling Emma what's going on. You know, that that's that's the adultery. Even if even if God said go do this, if he did it behind his wife's back, it's still adultery because he didn't do it the right way. In the happiness letter, Joseph Smith talks about this idea of if you steal an apple, then it's wrong, but if you ask for one that's given to you, then it's no longer theft. It's the same thing here. You can't say, Oh, well, God gave me this apple, I'll repent to the person who owns the tree later. He made a commitment and a covenant with Emma. And it's the same thing here with these these young girls. Sure, maybe God told them to marry them, but they ne he needed to wait until they were 18 years old at the absolute earliest. And this idea that marrying a girl is going to save her family, that, that's ridiculous. And Jesus talked against that in the Revelation and Doctrine of Saints too, and he said, it is I and I alone that brings salvation. Who you marry doesn't get you a higher into a higher kingdom. So, and, and, and I'm going to go back to my parking lot analogy. You know, if you really, truly believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, then you know that he knows that whatever he's doing here is going to create an example for the future generations. So when you see people like the FLDS church with marrying 14 year old girls, they can use this as an excuse, but I'd rather use it the way that we use King David's sin and point to it and say, this is a good man making a horrible mistake. 14 is too young. 16 is too young. 17 is too young. And in my opinion, 18 is too young. The revelation that I received said that if you're going to enter a polygamous relationship, then you need, they, they need to be consenting adults of at least 21 years of age at that point. Now, if you get married at the ripe old age of 18, that gives you a couple of years there of monogamy before you can even think about becoming a polygamist. And again, I, I really do think that in the Latter-day Saint movement, we obsess too much with this stuff. I, I don't think this stuff matters as much as we think it, do, it does, except to say that when it's, it's used to abuse people or collect people, then that is a heinous crime. Not merely a sin, but a crime. It's a crime against God. It's a crime against our fellow man. It, it is a crime. So let's, number one, stop obsessing over polygamy. And number two, if we do feel called to be polygamists, let's do it through the law of love. Let's stop trying to emulate the sins of the past. I don't know of anybody who uses the story of David and Bathsheba to excuse adultery. Therefore, we should not use the sins of Joseph Smith to excuse sexual immorality. That's my Thursday thought for you. And I leave it with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.